You are listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. We are here once again, and today we have another special show lineup for y'all. We're going to talk to amazing author Nita Sweeney. She's not just an amazing author. She's a she's a runner and she knows how to meditate. And she's coming all the way from Columbus, Ohio, remotely via Zoom. And that's been popular for the past two years. First and foremost, I just want to welcome Miss Nita to the show and say, how are you doing? Thank you for inviting me. I'm doing really well. I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you and to just kind of dive into things and um share my experience with your audience. So hi, everybody. Thank you so much. And you have a powerful story. Like I said, before we started, I was very inspired just reading about you. I mean, the fact that you've run so many marathons and half marathons since 2010. I mean, you're just walking the walk, talking the talk and showing up. But before we even go into all that stuff, let's learn a bit about you and how this all started. So... It started kind of dark. I have had chronic depression most of my life. I'm bipolar and I due to a lot of different things, but mostly a year in which so many people I love died. It started with my niece, who's 24. At one point, my father-in-law died. My niece's cat died. And then in December of the same year, my mother died. And it just, it completely took my feet out from under me. I don't know how else to say it. I was already not in a great place and it drove me to despair. Um, I wasn't really sure I still wanted to be here. And I was sitting on my sofa. There may have been bonbons. I'm not sure. I don't remember, but I was sitting there and the social media post of a high school friend popped up and she said, call me crazy, but this running is getting to be fun. And I I, I had to read it twice because she was like me, not athletic. She was at least as large as I was at that time, a year older than me. And we weren't exactly spring chickens. I think I was 49. And I thought, what is she doing? So I watched her and I watched her and I watched her and I didn't, you know, I'd comment on her post. Good for you. Way to go. Things like that. But never thought I would take up running. And then it just planted this seed. It planted this seed and as my mood got worse, I kept thinking, I have to try something. I mean, I was already in therapy. I already had my meditation practice. I was on some medications. You know, I, I had some community. I have a wonderful husband, great family. And yet I was, I was beyond miserable. I was empty and flat. And so one day I leashed up the dog kind of as a decoy, thinking maybe the neighbors would think I was just walking the dog, you know. I didn't want any of them to think I was going to try running at my age, my size, my lack of ability, all of that thing. And we went down into this hidden ravine. And the plan that my friend had followed, it's called Couch to 5K. It's an interval training plan. And when I read it, the only thing I saw was 60 seconds of running. Now, it said a lot of other things, but that stuck in my mind. And I thought, if my friend can do this, I can do this. 60 seconds doesn't seem very long. So I set that timer for 60 seconds and the dog and I jogged for 60 seconds. And that's not all we did. I mean, you know, we walked and then we jogged a little more, but that, be- that became that step into the unknown, put me on this trajectory that ended up with me not only running all these races, but reducing the number of medications I take, having much more self-confidence and eventually realizing my lifelong dream of having a book published, which I had tried to do repeatedly unsuccessfully for years. So it was, it it felt like the missing piece that movement, I, you know, I'm a runner, I love running, but running's not for everybody. So that's kind of how it started. And I just, I just think it's like this window for me, it was just this window and, or maybe a door is a better analogy. I could have just watched the door open and close but I was at a place in my life where I knew I needed a change and I needed a big change. And so I walked through what seemed like an open door. And your book, I mean, the title right away, it just captured me the 
Title of this uh, depression hates a moving target. How running with my dog brought me back from the brink. When I first heard that, I mean, there's a story within that. If you don't mind, share the audience because you had an original title and then you had a slight change adjustment when you got with the publisher. Yes, the original title was Twenty Six Point Freaking Two, and it wasn't a horrible title, but uh, my publisher. It's great because not they don't always do this with authors, but my publisher collaborates with the author on pretty much everything. And so she's the editor said to me, what else she got? Because that's good, but not great. We need something great. And that phrase is something. I don't know. I've just always said I'm sure that I wasn't the first one who said it. And I've heard many people say it since famous people. But it was one that I would say to other friends who were struggling uh, this one friend in particular called me one day at, I don't know, it was like three o'clock in the afternoon. And she said, Nita, I cannot get out of bed. I don't know what to do. I can't get out of bed. And it just popped in my head. I said, remember, depression hates a moving target. So just get out of bed. Just even if you just sit up on the edge of the bed, when you've done that, call me back. And I hung up and then she called me back and she was sitting up and I said, all right, remember, depression hates a moving target. Just walk to the bathroom and brush your teeth. And I hung up and then, and then another time, you know, I called her and she did the same thing for me, but that's kind of been um, sort of a slogan because the idea is that we're, for, I, I say we, but I'm fighting inertia. I'm often fighting what feels like a heavy, heavy weight, a physical weight on my body because of the depression and I'm bipolar. So I also get hypomania, but most of the time, when I have symptoms, they're that heaviest heaviness, that darkness of depression. And the movement, whether it's just getting out of bed and going and brushing your teeth or going outside and taking a walk or lifting weights or, you know, that movement gets us out of the lethargy. And it's not, you know, it's not going to, it didn't fix everything, but it made such a difference. So that's where the title came from. It's just the saying that my friends and I have kind of bantered around for years Remember, depression hates a moving target. So let's, you know, just get up, just get out of bed. Once again, listen to Army Focus Radio talking to our special guest, Miss Nita Sweeney. And man, let's talk about your dog because you told me before we started the interview that you have a recently new dog because the original dog from the book has gone to dog heaven. So tell us about the original dog that is talked about in this book and how special that dog was in your life. Well, that was Morgan. And his nickname was Mr. Dog. And I swear that I, I don't know who lost him because he was a rescue. He was found near a freeway. And uh, we got him through essentially the pound. And he was a yellow Labrador. But he came to us at, I don't think he maybe was six months old, totally housebroken, completely trained. It was just like somebody lost him. I, I'm, I'm, like I said, we tried to find the owners. We went through all the channels to try to find the owner. And nobody claimed him. And he was just the perfect dog. Um, he did occasionally, you know, chew up a pillow. He did. I think it was him that chewed not just one of my husband's left moccasins, but after he replaced the moccasins, the second left moccasin. So he did do that. But otherwise, <laughs> he was a really good dog. And he was just a very gentle dog. He was big. Um, and when he started running, he just knew right away to stay at my left side you know, we had walked and done some very basic training with him, but he was pretty much trained. And he had this stride. Um, when you run, uh, people think about bouncing up and down, but you're actually not supposed to bounce much. If you are running and someone just looks at your head, your head should be kind of going along in a straight line and it should be parallel to the ground. So you're, when you're running, you don't really bounce up and down. Your legs are moving up and down, but your body's not supposed to bounce. And that's the way Morgan trotted along beside me, his back straight, his tail up, his head erect, his ears flapping a little bit, but not nothing bouncing. And I just kept thinking he was like my coach. And in the book, I, I sort of give him words sometimes because I could tell he would get a little impatient with me. He'd want to he'd want to go when I was fiddling around doing something else. And so I'd look at him. He'd just give me this look. and Mom come on, you've got the watch on, you've got the shoes on, let's go. And uh, interestingly, Scarlett does something similar with that, where she kind of gives me that look. That's our um, 
that's a new dog. Um, because after we lost Morgan, we couldn't bear it. I mean, it just was so hard. Um, he lived to be, I want to say he was 14 and, uh, he lived a really good long life and we couldn't bear it without him. Um, and, uh, I'll just tell you real quick. I went to go right at a coffee shop and my husband went to the bookstore and he texted me from the bookstore supposedly. And he said, I need your help. And I texted back, what? And he texted me a photo of him holding a yellow Labrador puppy. And I said, I thought you went to the bookstore. And he said, the pet shop was next to the bookstore. And oh my gosh, that was not my plan. <laughs> I was going to rescue another dog, all this. So yeah, we ended up with this pet shop dog, but she's just a gem and she runs with me too. We just got back just now um, from a little trot around the neighborhood and uh, she's turned out to be a good dog. I think it's just that Morgan was the first dog. He's the one I started with. So he'll always have that special place in my heart. And I wrote so much about him and you know, so he's kind of memorialized, which I think is wonderful because he just was, he was my first dog coach. Now Scarlett's my new dog coach. So, And it sounds like Morgan just is a true legend because this book has been just, to say the very least, it's blown up. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's really has, it's still taking up. People all around the world are reading it. Everyone is giving their feedback. And I know it's not just because everyone loves dogs, but it's, it's really just about the story behind everything. Was anything shocking to you as far as how much attention this book has received? It's awesome to see <laughs> that this book took a life of its own, so to speak. Yeah, it's been a very pleasant uh, surprise. I I just didn't know what to expect. It's interesting because I've been in the writing community for a very long time, but until it happens to you, it, even, you know, I would hear people talk about what it was like to have a book either take off or not take off. And until you're actually experiencing it, you just don't know. And so it's very funny because I know people are buying the book. They're leaving reviews They're You know, I'm being asked for appearances. Um, I'm just got interviewed by a big women's magazine. Uh, a blurb was in another women's magazine. I mean, so there's getting a lot of hype. And yet here I am at home running down the streets of our neighborhood with the dog. You know, so it's a, it's like it's like anything else. Um, there's a great um, a great book title I love. It's After the Enlightenment, The Laundry. And so that's kind of what it's like. It's, you know, after the, the great success, um, you feed the dog or after... Uh, you get a great review on Amazon. Um, you know, you go for a run and you take a shower. So there's a lot of ordinary ordinariness to it. But it's been because it was my lifelong dream, and I tried really hard for a long time, and I pitched the book to a lot of places before Brenda Knight at Mango Publishing. Thank goodness I call her my fairy godmother because she picked it up. She believed in it and uh, has championed it. And I had worked so hard for that and really didn't think it was going to happen. I mean, I really didn't think it was going to happen this way. So yeah, it's, I'm, I'm still sort of stunned half the time. And then I go brush my teeth and then I go, you know, <laughs> eat dinner with my husband. It's actually very ordinary a lot of the time. Once again, talking to our special guest for today, Nina Sweeney. And after you do all that, I mean, you wrote another book. Why not? You can pre-order your book right now on your website, NinaSweeney.com. The title of this book is Make Every Move a Meditation. Now, what inspired that, that book? Because I know you have more than two books written, but this particular book, what inspired that writing? Well, I have been meditating, doing mindfulness practice meditation um, practice for oh, 25 years. And so I wanted to write something about mindfulness meditation. I had something in mind, but the first book was really about movement and he mental health. It's really a running book with a mental health thread in it because it goes through um, very specifically my journey of running and the things that happened and the training and all that. And so the publisher was concerned. I mean, this is what happens. They're a concerned that all of a sudden I would start talking about mindfulness, which I talk about meditation in, in Depression is a Moving Target, but not at great length not in detail. So they said, how, what do you, how can you, you know, combine it? And the truth is I meditate while I run. Sometimes it's as simple as choosing to focus on my left foot, just the sensations that might be, I might be feeling when my foot hits the ground, just to use that as a way to focus and 
remain calm and especially during long runs, you get bored. And so you have to get interested in something else. And so I'll be interested um, in something in the present moment to try to keep my mind in the present moment. And so I said, well, what about if I explain in a book how I meditate while I move? And we needed to make it broader than just running because I meditate when I walk, I meditate as I go through the day. And I know a lot of people who meditate doing other sports, other types of fitness, other types of exercise. I got a friend who plays, um, does laser tag, another one who does disc golf, a guy who dances. I mean, have a, lots of people I know that are in the meditation community that use um, movement as their posture, if you will. Because if you talk to serious meditators, a lot of times there's discussion of posture when you're sitting. You should be erect, but yet relaxed. You should you know, have your head... Um, your chin tilted down a little bit. Uh, sometimes you sit cross-legged or your feet flat on the floor if you're in a chair. That's a posture. And so when I'm running and meditating, my posture is running, is movement. And so um, they were very interested in that. And it's, I'm, you know, the book's not out yet. It comes out uh, in August of, of this year. But it's gotten great feedback already. It, it was featured in the Wall Street Journal, which uh, that we didn't pitch that. I mean, that's not... PR, we sought out some reporter, Ellen Gamerman, contacted me. And a couple of the meditation uh, teachers that I have worked with have been really impressed with the book. So, so I think I hit on something that people were looking for because nobody's got time right now. I mean, people are so busy. So what if you could combine your meditation practice with whatever form of exercise or movement you're already getting? And so the book talks about my anxiety and how movement meditation helped with that. It talks about um, paranoia and depression and all the kinds of ways that my mind plays tricks on me and how the combination of movement and meditation, how I work with those things using that. And so it's a little different spin on movement meditation or um, mindful movement because it does have that mental health angle. And I think right now, people are starting to talk much more openly about mental health issues and about how we all have, you know, it's kind of like a spectrum. Everybody has something that's tweaking them. And for me, it can be, um, it can be fatal if I'm not treating it on a regular basis. For other people, it's just an annoyance and, and then everything in between. And so I wanted to share how I use movement meditation as um, the, another kind of tool in my toolkit. Because I still do sitting meditation. And of course, I run a lot. And um, I do, you know, other things like I had, I do go to therapy, I take medication, but much less medication than I did. Um, you know, so it's a, a, such an important part of who I am. And once we, once we realized that I could combine the movement with meditation, not just in my practice, but as a book, as a, as a, as a um, kind of a guidebook for other people, it just, came, it took, it took shape. They wanted it. And uh, so it's coming out in August. I'm, I'm just so excited. <laughs> I worked really hard on it too. I had, I had, at one point, I think I had 47 books out of the library. It doesn't have a lot of footnotes in it, but I wanted to do enough research that it felt solid, that I knew I wasn't the only one doing once again, talking to Nina Sweeney here on I Refocus Radio, you go to her website, ninasweeney.com. And I know why you have so much that you can give to people as far as experience and wisdom and your stories because you did it. <laughs> I mean, we, we haven't even touched on the marathons and races that you've done. Like we haven't scratched the surface. We just kind of teased the audience. So <laughs> I know we don't have that much time left, but I want to squeeze this in here. What is some of your uh, memories with actually being marathons and, and races, different types of races, because that had to been, you know, something that took courage. It's not like people just get up one day and say, oh, I'm going to just run, you know, with everybody else. I'm trying to think. I think the the memory that always comes back to me is I'm a slow runner and I don't apologize for that. But it by the time I came in to the finish of my first marathon, most everybody was gone. The staff was still there and the people who knew me and the other late finishers, you know, the, the end of the back of the pack. Who watched us. So they let my husband into the finish corral, the finish uh, shoot, which they don't usually do. They don't usually let anybody in there, but because it was so late. 
So I crossed that finish line and he was there waiting for me. And I couldn't believe that I had finished a marathon. I just could not. I mean, it's still some days I'm looking at the medals right now. And I still some days think what? And he wrapped his arms around me and I wrapped my arms around him. And the official race photographer caught that moment of us embracing after I had finished that. And that moment right there, I ran with a woman named Julie DeBoard and she was so inspiring. Um, she'd run a race before and she just stood there and watched us just embrace because it was, uh, it was just a moment. I mean, it's just nothing like it. So that's, I mean, there's so many memories I could go on and on, but that's probably the one that, um, cause he's always been there for me. He's always been there for me. Um, and we've had some, I've had some rough mental health patches. And so that moment of him embracing me when I finished was priceless. Yeah. I had to plug your title of your first book. Cause when I first read it, I was hooked. I was like, man, that is awesome. Cause it's a good statement. And the title depression hates a moving target. How running with my dog brought me back from the brink. I mean, that first statement, the president hates a moving target. That is so powerful, man, because and when you explain about your friend, how she would call you and then you tell her the president hates a moving target, get up and then she'll call you back and you say, go brush your teeth. It's like an action. Just, it's like, take this baby step. Okay, take that baby step. Yeah. Like, that is so inspiring. Like, did you realize how uh, powerful your uh, determination will inspire so many people? I don't know, because to me, it just felt like something I needed to do. And I have to be careful not to think too much about the audience. I mean, I'm thinking about your audience and love that they're here. But when I'm writing, I really have to write for one person. And that was actually a different high school friend. I, if I'd thought about all the people that would eventually read the book, I would have been so terrified. I might not have put a word down, but now I feel the power of it. I mean, I felt the power of the phrase myself because that's how I had to live. I had to remind myself, you just have to get up. You just have to get moving um, or I would just be frozen. So, yeah, I mean, so no, I guess I, the answer is really no. I didn't, I didn't see it coming because if I look too far ahead, it's just too scary for me. And I think that's part of the meditation practice is I just really try to stay right where I'm at right now. I'm just here talking to you when I'm writing, there's just the page in front of me. If I'm doing um, a revision, then I am thinking about the audience, but I'm just in whatever page I'm working on. I just have to keep it really simple or I scare myself to death. So, but uh, thank you for, thank you for acknowledging how well it has done, because it's wonderful to feel like I'm touching people's lives. It really is um, to be able to call myself a mental health advocate, because that wasn't that wasn't really in my vision. But that's definitely what has happened. And that's just fantastic. I mean, to be able to help people is amazing. I love what you just said moments ago, basically saying stay within the moment, like not looking too far ahead and not worrying about so many other things in front of you, but kind of worrying about what's on your plate at the very moment. That right there is like inspiring to hear because we don't always think like that. You know, sometimes we get so busy, caught up in our careers, or whatever. We, we just want to worry about every little detail for the next 20 years, but we can't control that. We can only control the moment that we have right now. So uh, I just want to point that out, that that was awesome what you just said. Once again, we've been talking to Nina Sweeney. Go to the website, ninasweeney.com. I believe you have like a newsletter that people can sign up for. You give like little inspirational things and uh, updates. Tell us about that. Yes, I have two things. I have, well, you'll, they'll both end up in the same place, but I have a free ebook called Three Ways to Heal Your Mind, which you can download that if you want. Or I have Nita's News. So if you go on the website, you'll see the link at the top, Nita's News. And once a month, maybe twice a month, I curate other articles, I uh, have blog posts, but it's just kind of uplifting information about what is helping me stay here and do the things I do. And, you know, hopefully, I mean, so far it's got been really well received. So would love for people to join that. But well, once again, I want to say thank you to you, Nina Sweeney, be on I Mean Focus Radio. Before we sign out officially, would you like to say anything to the audience? 
just do your best, have fun, finish up right, do your best. <laughs> That's what I always say when people ask me for race advice. I just say, have fun, finish up right because that's what it's all about. It's just be right here. And there's a lot of joy right here. Man, I like that. See, you're like a, you know, a life coach that wasn't <laughs> expected, you know? So yeah, I didn't expect it. <laughs> you know, like it's awesome. But uh, once again, definitely inspired by your story. Like I told you in the green room before we started the interview, when I first saw this, I said, man, this is definitely something I want to talk about because I love when people just beat the odds and you you made it look so easy too i mean geez. <laughs> i know it wasn't well, easy yeah. but i'm just saying you make it thank look you. so easy <laughs> thank you very much thank you i want to say uh thank you for taking time of your super busy schedule talking to i refocus radio today thank you so much for giving me the opportunity i am refocus radio is brought to you by foo four star and holy crab Foo Four Star is a family-owned Asian restaurant in San Antonio, Texas. We have been a local favorite for Asian cuisine for over 10 years. With nothing but full smiles and fast service, you'll be leaving satisfied. Come on in for some authentic Vietnamese food. Holy Crab is one of a kind Cajun Creole style seafood restaurant located in Universal City, Texas. We offer traditional seafood items as well as chicken and steak. We also offer seafood boils. Come give us a try. You won't be disappointed. You can find these two eateries in Universal City, Texas at 2921 Pat Booker Road.